My name's Mick Napier. I have given the last 10, 12 years to active campaigning in support of Palestinian freedom. And I'm chair of the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. I was born in 47, two years after the war, in a working class area of Glasgow. Uh, we were poor. Uh, but I think virtually everybody in the street was poor, so we kind of fitted in. I think I was a difficult child. Um, I performed very well at school, but I clashed with teachers, and I think my way of uh, getting back at teachers was to perform well. And I, I remember when, it, when I left primary school, I was top of the school. But I was a bit um, angry because the kid who came second got a wonderful book. Uh, which I just looked at with envy. We had f hardly any books in our house. We would look at a neighbour's TV through the window, see flickering images. Uh, but then we began to see ads. And when you saw ads about how other people lived, I think probably for the first time in British history, the images of plenty that people lived with contrasted with the way we lived. And therefore I grew up with a, a, a very strong feeling that there was something wrong with the world and that we shouldn't be like this while other people were very wealthy. And being born two years after the Second World War, images of the Nazi Holocaust were very dominant and prominent and dark in our consciousness. We, were, we read it through comics, we read it through kids' magazines, on the TV. And that's remain, remained with me all the time, a sense of how brutal human beings can be to each other. So when I began to, when I got near to leaving secondary school, I had a sense of uh, hundreds of millions of people in the world being hungry, burning with a sense of injustice. I first of all applied to Glasgow University to study food science. I really had an idea that I would come up with a solution to world hunger in my lab. And I really, like many kids of that time, I considered going to Israel. Uh, to work in a kibbutz. Israel had a very ill-deserved reputation for, a very positive reputation. In the event I didn't, I went to West Africa. I did a year with voluntary service overseas. I didn't understand at that time, it was this uh, um, humanitarian wing of, uh, of the British Foreign Office. But I, I worked for a year in Ghana in West Africa. And then when I came back, having witnessed the coup in 66, which overthrew Nkrumah, the nationalist, uh, the independence leader, in what was openly a, a CIA-sponsored coup, I could see that the free school books disappeared, the, the film of reform was run backwards, um, and I could see that years and years of effort could be undone by a political action using the army in a very short period of time. So I came back to Scotland, uh, cancelled my application, to, which had been accepted, to study food science at Glasgow, and decided to study politics at another Glasgow university. Well, I threw myself into the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign, um, spent four years pretty much uh, concentrated on that. We marched through Scotland and through London. Um, we chanted uh, Ho 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 Chi Minh, victory to the Viet Cong. Uh, we called for the defeat of American militarism. And uh, my abiding lesson from that is that we won, that a principled movement of solidarity with a struggle of colonial people against dispossession, against invasion, uh, together, you know, that, that, that understands what it's trying to do and understands what it's trying to achieve, can be successful. And I take that lesson from the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign to setting up the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. We took a P and replaced, we took, we took away the V and replaced it with a P. Um, but the working ethos has always been to support Palestinian resistance to Zionism, to dispossession, to crime, to stress British complicity, British government complicity in Israeli crimes from Balfour to Tony Blair, um, and to work in a creative way and in a determined and assiduous way um, to support that Palestinian struggle for freedom. I'm going down now to Portland Place, just near the BBC headquarters, 
the assembly point for a demonstration. This is Al-Quds Day and the demonstrations against the dispossession of the Palestinian people of Jerusalem. The demonstration is due to start in about half an hour or so. In the 80s I went to work in the Middle East and when the first Intifada broke out I travelled to Cairo and then up to Palestine and I was horrified, really horrified um, to meet people, to discover the brutality and the, the bureaucratic mechanisms that were used, the creative nastiness that was used to make life unbearable for the Palestinians, together with cruelty and killing and maiming and so on. It was the time when Yitzhak Rabin was in charge of counterinsurgency in the West Bank and he coined the phrase, break their bones. They wanted temporarily to bring down the rate of killing in, uh, in the occupied territories. So they replaced killing to some degree with uh, smashing bones. And this wasn't a metaphor, this was a, liter this was a policy to be taken literally. And we met people who'd, to whom that had happened. Um, I remember the man I travelled with from Saudi to Ramallah, as my, as, if, if I recall. We met a young woman who'd come out of her home in a village. Her, she was deaf. Uh, she realised her brother was missing, the Israeli soldiers told her to do something she didn't hear. The soldiers followed her into the, the home, held her down and broke both legs with rubber bullets a very short distance. Saw her in hospital and uh, heard the story. Uh, so it was a shocking experience and from there I began to commit to the issue of Palestine significantly. But even that was still one among many other issues until the outbreak of the second Intifada, the Al-Aqsa Intifada, when I just read in the newspaper somebody was calling a small demonstration in Edinburgh at the US consulate. I went along, a group of 30 people, they made the right speeches and then the person organising the demonstration said thank you for coming and, and we'll see you again sometime. I just said to people then, who, who wants to go down to Princess Street on Saturday, we'll produce a leaflet, we'll start agitating among the population. And we set up a, what we called, I think, the Ad Hoc Committee on Palestine. And that, that morphed over a few months into the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. When I was in my teens, I almost, like a lot of young people in the 60s, went to work on a kibbutz in Israel. At that time, Israel had undeservedly a lot of popular support. There was fantastic sympathy because of the Holocaust. What's happened in the last 40 years? It's been entirely uh, blown away. So Israel's up against the limits of its power because military power doesn't count for anything when people like this are moving by their hundreds of thousands and by their millions. And especially within this movement, when organised labour begins to show its power, and that's already begun to happen. The appeal from Palestine for boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel, as I recall, was issued a year after the International Court in The Hague gave a ruling that Israel's apartheid wall, Israel's separation barrier, was illegal was a flagrant violation of international law, had to come down, and enjoined every state that subscribed to the international court, including Britain, to take practical steps to have the wall dismantled and reparations paid to the many Palestinians whose lives and livelihoods had been damaged by this wall. The response of Britain and the EU was to reward Israel, not to put the slightest um, pressure on Israel to remove the wall and notoriously Gordon Brown, our Chancellor and then Prime Minister briefly, um, accepted the wall and told Palestinians it's the economy stupid, we'll accept the wall and we'll try to build up the Palestinian economy so that Palestinians would live in a nightmare world of living inside a walled city for example or a walled area and travel to a, a factory under Israeli, presumably uh, Israeli military control, and go back to their walled prisons at night. So the, the, count, the, the, the appeal for boycott, divestment and sanctions, a year later was a direct result of that. And it said to civil society around the world, your governments will do nothing, or what they will do is 
is counter to the, to the court's ruling, we appeal to civil society to move because your governments are moving in the wrong direction. So take action. We support the Palestinian appeal for boycott, and that involves cultural boycott, that involves theatre groups, and it involves musicians. If they carry guns to kill and maim and injure, then people have a right to resist by any means necessary. If they carry violins as part of a Zionist project, then we have to resist it. So we decided that when they came to the Edinburgh Festival, the largest arts festival on the planet, uh, that we would protest. We would organise leafleting outside, we would inform people that these people were actually, they held the official role of distinguished IDF musicians. IDF is the Israeli name for their army. But we also decided to protest inside and we went inside and a few minutes into the performance, 10-15 minutes, I jumped up and shouted, end the siege of Gaza, uh, these people are army musicians. Uh, so every 15 minutes four or five of us did the same thing. Uh, we were arrested. Something very interesting happened. We were ready to pay the price. Uh, we expected a, a fine, um, you know, some inconvenience. Um, but shortly after our protest, an event was held in London called, uh, bizarrely, called the World uh, Campaign Against anti Combating Anti-Semitism. And the great and the good from British politics were there. Uh, but also a couple of uh, Israeli cabinet ministers and politicians were there. Uh, the, this August conference issued a call for combating what they call anti-Semitism. And it included um, a call for support for Palestinian BDS to be criminalised. Um, Gordon Brown was the first head of state to sign the declaration which issued from this conference. And very shortly after that, the charges against us change from a fairly routine breach of the peace, uh, which is a catch-all, to uh, racially aggravated conduct. It was so ludicrous and it gave us the opportunity in court over actually 22 court uh, sessions in over two years, it gave us the opportunity to really take this piece of nonsense and, and explain to people what it was. Anti-Zionism is a duty and anti-Semitism is something that we always strenuously resist. Our our opponent is not a group of people, it's not a population, it's a system. So we want to change our political structure, not uh, get rid of a group of people. So we made that point repeatedly during the court process. Uh, we marshaled a, a whole array of, uh, of potential witnesses in court. The recording was important in the case. It was good that we finally forced the BBC to release it. Uh, but then the education of our lawyers uh, continued because they realised that their take on this had been very inadequate. Uh, they had misunderstood the fundamentals of the case and that really it was boycott that was on trial as racism. Luckily, uh, we won uh, in a Scottish court, the first court where it was heard. The charges against us were ridiculed. The sheriff threw them out of court, um, actually used satire, it's fairly uncommon in a Scottish courtroom, from a sheriff anyway, and he said that if the charges against us were justified, we would have to carry placards saying end genocide in an unnamed Middle Eastern state because you couldn't even mention Israel. I want to talk today about four things. The horror of the Israeli crimes against the people of Palestine. The complicity the complicity of our government in these crimes from the beginning until yesterday. But I want to talk about hope, about how the criminals can be defeated. And I want to finish by making an appeal for one particular battle that's coming up. British government complicity goes from one B to another B, from Balfour who gave Palestine to European colonists while Hitler was sleeping rough on the streets of Vienna. To Tony Blair, who today, today is your and my official representative to bring peace to the Middle East. A man who cannot appear on a platform in Britain is still our official representative. The EU 
gave Israel enhanced relations on 60 different areas, including aerospace, even as they are openly discussing an attack on Iran. We have enhanced their access to missile technology. Their complicity is never ending and will not end until we end it. We are the people we have been waiting for. Don't wait for anybody else. We are the solution. Well, people, you know, various initiatives, the flotillas, the, uh, the small boats, had attempted to challenge the, uh, the Israeli brutal siege of Gaza. We thought that while the world was rightly beginning to look at Gaza, they were forgetting about the, in some ways, worse reign of terror that was, uh, that was permanent across the West Bank from north to south. And so we thought that we should flag up this Israel's illegal siege. And what better way than to travel to Palestine as travelers, peacefully, um, to travel to Ben Gurion Airport, um, Tel Aviv Airport, present ourselves at passport control and say, I would like to proceed to Bethlehem, for example. I mean, I, I had been through Tel Aviv Airport many times. I had always lied. I had always said I was headed to Tel Aviv or Eilat or some hiking in the Judean hills. Um, would I meet any Arabs? No. I mean, the racist profiling, the, the, the Israeli siege of, of Palestine begins at Tel Aviv Airport. The apartheid structures are very obvious there when you indicate that you wish to visit Palestinians. So we decided not to lie. We decided to present ourselves and tell the truth. And so we flew in, we arrived, we went to passport control, as I had done many times. Where are you going? I'd like to proceed to Palestine. Oh, stand over there, we we're taken away. Um, into a place away from the public. Um, I, <laughs> there I met some old friends, some French and Belgian and others. I was in the middle of explaining to about 50 people in, in this occasion that the British government, following the Israeli assassination of uh, Palestinian resistance um, f uh, activists in a Dubai hotel room, had instructed all British citizens not to allow their passports to be taken out of line of sight by any Israeli official because they used them to copy some for purposes of murder and assassination. But while I was explaining this uh, to people, um, the soldiers attacked. Uh, they grabbed one young French guy, uh, took him outside, put the handcuffs on. They took me outside, put the handcuffs on. Uh, took us into a big steel armoured vehicle, you know, armoured bus um, for transport to Tel Aviv prison and there we were banged up for a few days. Um, it was the Hilton wing of the Israeli prison system. A few hundred metres away, Palestinians were incarcerated and tortured and abused and so on. They refused to issue any charges, they refused to say what law, even Israeli law, which is a, an apartheid state, which law we had transgressed. When we came back to Britain, uh, colleagues at my work, everyone else I spoke to were horrified that peaceful travelers were not allowed to visit Palestine. And the strangulation of Palestine, I think, became a little bit clearer to a lot of people. decided that this is not a one-off that we wish to continue. Uh, so we organised a repeat fly-in to um, Tel Aviv airport. We once again stressed on uh, Israeli television uh, to the British media as far as they were interested, this would be an attempt to pass unobtrusively and quietly through Tel Aviv airport. Um, but we're, you know, we're open, we have absolutely nothing to hide. It's the Israelis who have something to hide. So we organised the people who were going from Scotland, from one airport, from one um, uh, city in Scotland. We met in Edinburgh. We went to the trains and we had a nice little send off. You know, we had friends there to greet us, to, to, sorry, to see us off. Uh, a nice choir of uh, people who, you know, committed to all sorts of human rights campaigns, but they came there to support us. 
and we just had a good buy on the on the station platform, just as a group of tourists might um, organise if they were going anywhere in the world, a send off at the airport, or in this case the train station. And then we travelled down to Manchester Airport, uh, went to the check-in desk the following day. We had our we had our boarding passes, uh, which one now gets by by internet, and presented ourselves at the um, at the check-in to a shock, we were shocked, but not entirely surprised. Uh, most of us were identified and refused boarding. Um, and we had a demonstration in the airport. Uh, we organized, we demonstrated, the police were called, uh, and we kicked up as much of a fuss as we could for a period of time. This was repeated on a much larger scale um, in France and, and Belgium and elsewhere. The dispossession of Palestinians has reached a stage where within 48 Israel, where Palestinians owned 94% of the land in 48, and the Zionist colonists had managed to obtain by chicanery or purchase 6% of the land, those percentages have been almost exactly reversed. We are very suspicious of those people who propagate Holocaust Memorial Day. We have seen demonstrations in Trafalgar Square where those people who are on the Holocaust Memorial Trust celebrate the massacres of Operation Cast Lead. We invited uh, Dr. Heil Mayer, who was a survivor of Auschwitz, a wonderful man, to a UK tour. He travelled all over Scotland. He spoke about his experiences briefly inside Auschwitz. He was a member of the resistance. Um, and then he spoke about how the dehumanisation of Jews by the Nazis was a precursor to, to the mass killings. And he, he noted similarities, not with the death camps, but with the process of dehumanisation of Palestinians today. And that this holds out the possibility of mass killings in the future, given that they're already dehumanized by Zionist propaganda. I'd have to say that the official celebrators of Holocaust Memorial Day, Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, those people who use the Holocaust to justify their barbarism, uh, completely uh, censored any reference to Dr. Mayer, who was referring to the Holocaust in the spirit that our campaign does to say it is not appropriate to commemorate the Holocaust without referring to barbarism today. So our position is a little bit special. We commemorate the Holocaust. We oppose those people who try to minimize the Nazi crime. Uh, we see genocide as something that Western European nations, Belgians, French, have committed for 500 years, um, but, we do, but, but we wish to tell people about the real Holocaust, the role of the Zionists within that as well, in order to sensitize people to commit to a struggle against injustice, oppression, racism and apartheid today. For a long time, people did not understand really how they could effectively support the Palestinians. We can demonstrate and that's very useful to come together and realize that we're not alone. But to actually deliver a blow against Israel and the Palestinian boycott campaign has risen faster and quicker and has become broader than the South African one in, in, an, in, an er, in earlier decades. We've seen uh, Veolia lose billions in contracts from Sweden to Australia and also in my own city Edinburgh and in London. Uh, for their violation of Palestinian rights. A key part of this campaign is cultural boycott. Bruce Springsteen refused to perform in Israel, Elvis Costello refused to perform in Israel, and this is really growing. But also, when Israeli state-sponsored and state-financed performers come here, or to other parts of the world, it's very important to make them unwelcome. And we hope to take the boycott campaign to a higher level, and to begin to get a bit closer to the sort of boycott campaign against South Africa, which saw South African sporting teams hounded from one game to another and really unable to perform. And it, let, it contributed 
to a collapse in the morale of the apartheid regime.